right. Thanks for letting me come. Um, I've got my notes on my phone here, so I apologize if it seems a little bit odd to be looking into a phone part of the time. But um, as since y'all live in Utah, I'm sure you know, and many of you grew up LDS. That uh, now, of course, people when people think about Mormons, they think about people like Glenn Beck. They think about people like um, uh, Mitt Romney. Obviously, super rich people that have a lot of roots in like the libertarian movement or just, you know, they're very conservative right wing. So they, uh, a lot of the, a lot of Mormons these days, including, or especially the leadership, they spend a lot of time doing things like trying to make sure, you know, gay marriage uh, isn't legal and making money. This is kind of like a big part of Mormonism now, but uh, that's very, contrary to the actual doctrine of the church and by doctrine I mean what you find in the books that Mormons consider to be uh, Holy Scripture so of course the Bible um, the Book of Mormon Pearl of Great Price and the Book of Moses in those books there's really radical teachings about economics um, against war um, so really those uh, books are very uh, radical in their nature, so it is odd for most people that know of Mormons now, again, considering people like Mitt Romney and things like that. So, um, I just wanted to first go through a little bit of the doctrine, um, and then after that go through a little bit of history from um, the early church once they got to Utah under Brigham Young. Um, so anyways, we'll first start with the doctrine. In, in the Bible, a lot, or a lot of times growing up, you always hear things like, um, you always hear about the gospel or the gospel of Jesus Christ. And amongst Mormons and maybe amongst Christians generally, there's kind of the idea that that just basically means like all of the teachings of Christianity or all of the teachings of Mormonism. But if you look at the actual texts in the Bible in the New Testament um, that refer to the gospel, Oftentimes they're translated as good news, and the good news that Jesus proclaims is basically that the kingdom of God is coming. So it doesn't really refer to all of the teachings that now in modern times we think about as being Mormon or Christian or whatever. It had a pretty specific meaning, which is the kingdom of God is coming. And so um, that had a very, uh, well, let me just read the first scripture uh, this is from Luke, where Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. So, again, one of the big uh, criticisms of religion, especially coming from, say, a Marxist perspective, is that it's, you know, Opium for the people, it basically teaches them, hey, be content with your lot in life now, and when you die, you'll go to heaven and you'll be in a better place. But Jesus, when he says uh, he's preaching good news, that is to the poor, and it has actual socioeconomic implications to it. So, um, for example, you always hear the kind of mysterious phrase where Jesus says, the last will be first and the first will be last. That's referring to that period of time when the, when the kingdom of God comes. The people that are first, the rich people, the people that are wealthy, the people that are oppressed, the poor, the people that are comfortable in this life, there'll be this great reversal, and those people will actually be last in the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, the people that will be first or favored of God are the people that are now, that are poor, that are hungry, and all these things. So the specific uh, scripture... Um, that teaches that and again, it's not just a spiritual thing. It's an actual um, concrete socioeconomic um, Changes that will be taking place So this is from Luke chapter 6 where Jesus says Blessed are, are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God Blessed are you who hunger now for you will be satisfied again meaning when the kingdom of God comes uh, blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. 
But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who will laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. So um, the message of Jesus really was revolutionary. If you think about his context, living under a Roman occupation where peasants were heavily taxed, uh, obviously treated very uh, poorly by both Roman authorities and even you know, their own uh, uh, Jewish leadership at the time. And life was really tough for peasant, uh, you know, your average peasant in um, Palestine at, at the time. Uh, and again, people are more familiar with the very brutal tactics that the Romans used, etc., in uh, trying to deal with the population. And because of that oppression, there were these um, occasional revolts against the Romans, sometimes violent, which were very brutally suppressed, and sometimes there were nonviolent revolts against the Romans. But that all reflects the, the context of the people or the context that the people were living in at the time and that would have been hearing Jesus's message these were people who were poor and oppressed not you know wealthy uh, Roman officials or uh, you know uh, Jewish officials that controlled the temple and received a lot of money from tithes and lived a good high life you know um, but then the question is is there any of that same uh, you know, revolutionary message within Mormonism, right? So, uh, the first thing that is maybe useful to mention is that in the Book of Mormon itself, oppressing the poor is strongly condemned. So here's an example. This is from Second Nephi, um, where Nephi, who was a prophet that supposedly lived in uh, the ancient Americas, uh, about 600 BC, and is uh, writing a prophecy now, like of what he sees in the future. He says this, he says, and the Gentiles, and this, according to most Mormon um, interpretation, is kind of a commentary on the, the United States, actually, because, again, this ancient prophet in the Americas is looking forward to what conditions would be like, um, you know, largely after in our rough period of time in modern history after the United States has been founded. So he says, um, oh, lost it. Uh, and the Gentiles, again referring to probably white North Americans, are lifted up in the pride of their eyes and have stumbled because of the greatness of their stumbling block, that they have built up many churches Nevertheless, they put down the power and miracles of God and preach up unto themselves their own wisdom and their own learning that they may get gain and grind upon the face of the poor. Okay, so again, saying, if you're exploiting the poor, this is specifically talking about in a religious context, which is maybe probably what the LDS church does now by taking tithing from all their members and spending it in these really terrible um, lavish, luxurious ways, um, but grinding the face of the poor or exploiting the poor is something that the prophet Nephi in the Book of Mormon condemns really strongly. So in addition to not condemning the poor, there's a lot of passages and teachings about it's your obligation as a Mormon or a Christian to help the poor. So um, a good example of that is the Sermon of King Benjamin, also again from the Book of Mormon, who was a king in ancient America, according to the book, where King Benjamin basically says, if you want to, you know, walk blameless before God, he says, I would that ye should impart of your substance to the poor, every man according to that which he hath, such as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and administering the, to their relief. Um, and he basically says, if, you know, we're all like beggars if we have to beg God for forgiveness and if we expect God to forgive us when we um, are begging him for spiritual forgiveness why would he do that if we don't you know forgive the beggar who's asking money for us and give to him just like God freely gives to people that may or may not deserve it um, but that you know kinda conveys a basic idea of charity well you know if you have a lot of money 
you should give it away. And there's nothing uh, incompatible with a capitalist um, economic system and being very charitable or generous. You know, if you're some railroad tycoon or a computer software tycoon, you just give a lot of your money away. There's nothing revolutionary about that, of course. Um, but a further comment by King Benjamin um, basically suggests that um, you know, people are poor due to systemic reasons, due to the type of economic system that we have, and not because they're poor and lazy. There's reasons why people are poor because of uh, a society that's capitalistic or based on private property, etc. So he says, um, if if you if someone asks you for you know, money that's poor, and you basically say, well, I'm not going to give him money because he deserves it, or he, he deserves his lot in life, he was just lazy, etc. King Benjamin strongly condemns that and says that um, uh, basically, you know, you'll be condemned if you take that attitude. So that's all from King Benjamin's famous sermon from the Book of Mosiah in the Book of Mormon having to do with poverty. So again, it's, it's systemic. Just because someone's poor, it's not because they're lazy. We still have an obligation to give to them because it, it, it's not necessarily their fault that they're poor. Um, later on in the Book of Mormon, there's actually um, a pretty specific condemnation of the basic principles that undergird a capitalist system, and that comes from the story of Korihor. And um, again, in the Book of Mormon, ancient America, there's supposedly a prof or a false prophet named Korihor. He comes, uh, you know, to the people of God and starts to preach the idea that there is no God on the one hand, and then secondly, he, he preaches um, a doctrine that basically is the equivalent of social Darwinism. So let me read this, uh, the comments from Korihor, this supposedly uh, false prophet from the Book of Mormon, where he says, um, Korhor basically, basically tells the people that there could be no atonement made for the sins of men, but every man fared in this life according to the management of the creature. Therefore, every man prospered according to his genius, and that every man conquered according to his strength, and whatsoever a man did was no crime. So again, that's basically social Darwin, Darwinism saying, in a like we would have in a capitalist society, if you're able to make money, then you know that's the type of society we should have. The stronger you are, the better, and that's how resources and wealth should be allocated. If you're smart or if you're powerful, if you're strong, you can take what you want, and there's no such thing as right or wrong. So that um, is condemned in the Book of Mormon. Again, this person, Korihor, is considered a false prophet, and uh, that outlook on life is strongly um, looked down upon in, in the book. So if we shouldn't have a society based on who is strongest, survival of the fittest basically, the question is what type of a society according to uh, Mormon doctrine should we have? And again in the Book of Mormon um, it tells us there's a, a, a part of the book where supposedly Jesus Christ, after he uh, dies and is resurrected in Jerusalem, just like you'd read about in the Bible, he ascends to heaven. But then in the Book of Mormon, there's a record of where he supposedly came back down to, uh, as a resurrected being, came back down to earth and visited people in different parts of the world, including in ancient America. And he establishes... Um, you know, his teachings amongst the people and everyone becomes very righteous and there's this kind of golden age that's ushered in. And it's not just, again, a golden age spiritually, it's a golden age economically. And so this is the description of this society among these people in ancient America as a result of them accepting uh, the gospel and following Jesus' teachings. Um, this is from 4th Nephi where the author says, And the Nephi people had all things in common among them, Therefore, there were not rich and poor, bond and free, but they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift. So again, it's really clear they had all things common among them. There's no rich and there's no poor. So in a, a society run along Mormon principles, you would have a communal economic system where you don't have private property, 
it's unacceptable for there to be um, poor people. And this is backed up by some other scriptures in the Doctrine and Covenants, which is a book of revelations that Joseph Smith supposedly received, different revelations. Again, I know a lot of you guys know all this already, but if there's anyone watching, just to give a little bit of background. But Joseph Smith is supposedly re receiving these revelations from God. And um, here is one example. Um, he writes, this is supposedly um, God speaking directly to Joseph Smith, where he says, In your temporal things you shall be equal, and this not grudgingly, otherwise the abundance of the manifestations of the Spirit shall be withheld. If, ye, if you are not equal in earthly things, you cannot be equal in obtaining heavenly things. So again, if you're not equal in your worldly possessions, holding all of your possessions in common, then you can't be equal in heavenly things, and that means you're not one. And there is a specific command that the Latter-day Saints or the Mormons are supposed to be one. Can I have you stand more against this so that way yep. the... Um... Let me know. That's good there. The spot. Perfect. And then just one final uh, scripture before I bore you with too many. This is, again, supposedly God speaking to Joseph Smith, suggesting that inequality of wealth is really offensive to God, where uh, God says to Joseph, But it is not given that one man should possess that which is above another, wherefore the world lieth in sin. So it's not given that one person should have more possessions than another, or it's not acceptable that one person have more possessions than another person, and as long as society is in that state, then you know that's a sinful state that society is in. And that um, scripture has a really close correlation to uh, a basic idea in liberation theology. Um, in liberation theology, there's the idea that there is institutional violence. If you live in a society where there's rich and poor, some people have all the money they need and are able to exploit the poor, and the poor are working like slaves and don't have enough food to eat, uh, any basic health care, all these different things, and are starving, etc. Even if people aren't actually fighting with guns, there are people starving and suffering as a result of the economic system and the political structure. And so that's institutional violence, and that is also institutionalized sin. So that's the language that like Catholic liberation theologians would use. So society is in a sinful state. So you see that same concept um, popping up in the Doctrine and Covenants um, as well. And so that's a big, also too, a justification behind the idea of, of armed struggle. So typically when you know poor folks in Latin America um, would try to change the economic system or have a socialist system or overthrow a right-wing military government, um, you know, there was the idea that if the government is, is oppressing them or there's enough government repression that they're justified in using guns and weapons to then fight back and overthrow um, the government, right? And so there was a lot of criticism from um, you know, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church or from, say, North American theologians that would say, well, you know, Jesus was a pacifist and so you're not it's not right for you to use guns and weapons or use armed struggle to try to change your society. You, you're not supposed to be violent like that. So the liberation theolo uh, uh, theology folks would say, well, look, we have a situation of institutionalized violence. The poor are the object of violence um, you know, all the time due to the economic system. And so the violence that they might use if necessary with rifles or as part of armed struggle is really a response. It's really self-defense more than, say, going on the offensive because we have to be aware of that institutional violence that exists. Um, so, uh, the final thing to mention, I guess, about both LDS theology and Christian theology generally is that there's the idea that if you are helping other people, you're helping God. Um, there is the passage from the book of Mosiah um, where that same King Benjamin says, if you are in the service of your fellow being, you're really only helping or you're really only serving God. There's also the parable of the sheep and the goats from Matthew 25 in the New Testament 
where um, there's at the end of the world people are being judged and the criteria on which they are judged is not whether they like believe that Jesus was the son of God or got baptized or did any of these other things that are you know currently parts of Christianity and Mormonism but instead they were judged and either welcomed into the kingdom of God or rejected based on whether they again visited the sick, um, fed the hungry, uh, clothed the naked, and things like that. And then at the end, Jesus says, you know, if you, in as much as you did this to your, to your fellow man, you also did it to me. So again, if you're helping other people, basically that's the way to serve God. Um, so that's forms the basis, for, again, for what type of a society you should have, where you're serving other people, you're making sure that there is no poor, and there is not inequality of wealth, which is exactly what you get in a capitalist, or in, in any capitalist society. So, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, these are ideas that no one in the, or not nobody, but at least the people in the leadership of the LDS Church, you know, they ignore, or maybe aren't even aware of, sometimes I wonder if they even read their own uh, you know, books of scripture, or they even know what's in the Book of Mormon, or what's in the Bible, sometimes I doubt they really even know. Um, but in the early days of, of the LDS Church, after the Mormons um, had to flee um, eastern parts of the United States and come to Utah and settle here, a lot of the members you know, came were really poor folks from England. A lot of the converts, they were working in factories or were very poor, living in terrible conditions in England. And so they were receptive to socialist ideas. They converted to Mormonism and came across, um, you know, would sail across the Atlantic and then finally make their way across the plains um, with, the, with the Mormons to Utah. So they were like, you know, these, this wasn't a shocking idea to think that we should all be socialists, right? To them it was just, it was kind of in the air, right, at that period of time in England. And even in the United States, it was kind of, um, there wasn't the type of stigma against uh, socialism that you find in the United States now for the most part. So when the Saints got to um, Utah, they basically had a socialist economy. It was more of a theocracy run by Brigham Young. So it's not like, say, a democratic socialist system or that you know we might advocate if you're a secular person. Brigham Young, who was the religious leader or the prophet at the time, he kind of ran the show, but basically um, he very ex explicitly said that, um, well, I'm just going to, I'll just go ahead and read to get the actual language so it doesn't just seem like I'm uh, making this stuff up here. And I know it's a little bit boring to just have someone read something, but again, just to be precise with the language, and this isn't super long. Um, so I'll just read, this is uh, from a, an article that I wrote for the, uh, the old newspaper, The Mormon Worker. Um, so here we go. The early Mormon settlers in Utah implemented a socialist economic system under the direction of Brigham Young. They never used the word socialism, but socialist is the only way it can really be described. What is even more surprising is that this socialist system helped to save um, the members of the church in Utah from widespread starvation in 1855. Were it not for a socialist economic system, the church may not have survived as we know it today. For example, when a group of new Mormon immigrants arrived in the Salt Lake Valley in the early 1950s, Mormon church president Brigham Young made it clear what kind of society they were entering. Quote, with regard to labor, don't imagine unto yourselves that you are going to get rich at once uh, by, your la by labor. As for the poor, there are none here, neither are there any who may be called rich, but all obtain the essential comforts of life. So when new immigrants came, they were given a plot of land or the tools or whatever they needed to be able to work and support themselves and support their family. But the idea that there would be rich and poor and have um, one person be able to basically own everything or to have a capitalist um, society just was not um, accepted. In the Salt Lake Valley, land was distributed to the members of the community according to the principle, quote, equal according to circumstances, wants, and needs. 
In regard to natural resources, Brigham Young explained that, quote, there shall be no private ownership of the streams that come out of the canyons, nor the timber that grows on the hills. These belong to the people, all the people, unquote. And that was the same, uh, or the same was true of mineral resources for mining as well. Um, a public authority was appointed to oversee water use. The canals and ditches were built on a community basis. The canals were built, quote, by the farmers, owned by the farmers, and operated by the farmers. Public buildings, roads, and bridges were all constructed communally. Uh, bishops, who were the leader of one particular Mormon congregation, would give out building assignments in church meetings on Sundays. Church members completed these projects by donating one day out of ten to public la labor as a tithe. Uh, in Salt Lake City, exploiting workers was considered socially unacceptable. Brigham Young once told the story of a bishop who stopped a member of his congregation from building a house because the man wasn't paying fair wages to his carpenters. Uh, a system of taxation was established which gave the tax collector, quote, discretionary power to pin down upon the rich and penurious and when the tax collector comes to a poor man or a widow that is honest, instead of taxing them, he would give them a few dollars. Uh, a system for donating surplus food to distribute to the poor was set up, while those who would not sell corn at reasonable prices to the poor were given a stern warning. Brigham Young said, and again, this is in a period where there is a big drought, so there are shortages of food. So Brigham Young said, if those that have do not sell to those that have not, we will just take it, namely the corn or the food, and distribute it among the poor. And those that have and will not divide their food willingly will be thankful their heads are not wallowing in the snow. So he just basically said, look, if we need food to feed the poor and you won't give it to us, we'll just come and forcibly take it. Um, so then in, in 1855, a series of natural disasters hit. First, uh, massive numbers of grasshoppers and crickets descended on the Salt Lake Valley, eating the Mormon settlers' crops. They descended like, quote, snowflakes in a storm and filled the sky, quote, as far as the eye can reach. Um, this was accompanied by a terrible late summer drought, which destroyed even more crops, including between a third and two thirds of the wheat harvest as well as much of the grass that the cattle needed for grazing. The Mormons then had to send their cattle to higher altitude areas in Cache Valley near Logan to find food for them. This was a disaster because in the winter of 1855 and 56, uh, it was extremely bitter and cold. Uh, about half of the cattle in the Utah Territory froze to death that winter. Um, official, church Mormon, official Mormon church historian Leonard Arrington stated that, quote, the destruction of both crops and livestock brought on a near famine. So faced with starvation, the leadership of the Mormon church implemented two new share the, uh, share the wealth programs. The first was called fast offerings, which you guys, if you grew up in the church, would remember. Um, so even though Mormons had long fasted, which is going without food for one day each month, um, although they had long fasted for spiritual reasons, they net, the church leadership now asks that everyone donate the food that they save by fasting, and the bishop would then distribute this food to the poor. Uh, the second program was a food rationing program. Uh, each father was asked to place his household on a ration of one half pound of breadstuffs per day and to use any extra food they had to feed people they employed or who were in their same congregation that went to church with them. Um, Brigham Young said that those who didn't comply with these two programs would be kicked out of the church and their excess grain would be taken. He introduced the program saying, if you do not pursue a righteous course, we will separate you from the church. Is that all? No. If necessary, we will take your grain from your bin and distribute it among the poor and needy, and they shall be fed and supplied with work, and you shall receive what your grain is worth. So Brigham himself during that period of the famine fed 200 people per day um, on his own as well as the 60 members of his family and all of the employees that worked for him. 
Um, so these programs were consistent with what God had supposedly told to Joseph Smith in a revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants, namely, quote, Behold, this is the way that I, the Lord, have decreed to provide for my saints, that the poor shall be exalted, in that the rich are made low. You know, read that again. Uh, this is the way that I, the Lord, have decreed to provide for my saints, that the poor shall be exalted, in that the rich are made low. And so that's reminiscent of those passages that, um, of Jesus in the New Testament saying, Again, when the kingdom of God comes, this is good news for the rich, or good news for the poor, but bad news for the rich, and the first will be last, and the last will be first. There'll be um, a swap. So again, the poor shall be exalted in that the rich are made low. That's also, um, you know, there are a lot of Mormon libertarians, and, you know, their big thing is that under no circumstances does the government ever have the right to take your money through taxes or anything else. Like, anytime the government takes your money, it's just pure stealing, right? And of course, that's a nice ideology when for people that are billionaires and super rich to try and ram down the throats of average Americans to act like if the government takes any money from a billionaire that that's stealing. Um, and so, But a lot of Mormons uh, buy into that idea because they're all about freedom and stuff like that, right? But this right here is just very clear um, again, especially given the context of how Brigham Young, you know, if he needed uh, food to feed the poor, he would just forcibly take it from people that had it. And, um, you know, if you want to call that theft, you can call it theft, whatever. But in the Doctrine and Covenants, it says right there, um, I've decreed to provide for my saints in that the poor shall be exalted, or the poor shall be exalted in that the rich are made low. So anyways, that's kind of a counter to this ideas of libertarianism that many Mormons have. So again, the church historian Leonard Arrington, Leonard Arrington commented about that period of the famine and the drought that, quote, the upshot of all these measures was that while all suffered, none died of starvation. So it basically kept the Mormon, um, you know, the Mormon community alive and allowed them to survive the fact that they implemented these socialist measures um, and they had a socialist economy. Um, again, uh, the timber and the water and the minerals and all the natural resources couldn't be owned privately. They were owned collectively by everybody. And then to go ahead and forcibly redistribute grain or whatever else needed to be to make sure that people survive. Um, so at any rate, again, that's... Uh, very uh, contrary to what we usually hear um, about Mormons today. Again, people like Mitt Romney, Glenn Beck, etc. But there is that really rich history of socialist thought in the Mormon church. Even though they didn't, wouldn't say, hey, we're socialists, or you know, join you know, socialist political parties in droves or anything like that, but nonetheless, from reading descriptions of how they actually ran their economy, as well as reading these different passages from the Holy um, Scriptures, or the Scriptures that they consider holy, uh, you can see that there is that rich socialist heritage um, in the Mormon Church. So that's it. So, I guess uh, uh, any questions? How do, how do you feel like um, mainstream forms of Protestantism and the idea that if you live a righteous life, then you'll be blessed with the bounty of the earth and stuff like this. And that's a, that's a sign of the fact that you're doing you know, good work, you're living righteously. How do you feel like that narrative either jives or is counter to the sort of Mormon teachings? Well, it, the interesting thing about Protestantism, um, Catholicism, and Mormonism, at least here in America in the last hundred years or so, is that you see a lot of the same trends in all, in all three. So in Protestantism, you'll get the social gospel, which is leftist in orientation and preaches the type of stuff that I've been mentioning today. But then in Protestantism, you also have like Calvinist ideas or this like gospel of prosperity where the whole point of being a Christian and going to church and praying is just ask God to bless you to like 
get a, you know, pass your test in school or to, you know, find your wallet if you lost it or to get a good job or to get rich. And then if you're prospering economically and you're making money or you're wealthy, that means that God, you know, loves you or whatever. So you definitely get that within Mormonism as far as the practice goes. And that's probably the most, that's kind of how Mormonism is taught today, you know. Maybe you guys remember, it hasn't been too long. But, you know, when you go to sacrament meeting and you hear people get up and give talks, that's what they talk about. It's like, please, God, help, you know, help me, you know, get that awesome job at the law firm or, you know, whatever. Help me pass my test. And these are all, you know, upper middle class white problems, right? But when you actually look at what's in the Bible, there's really strong criticism of rich people. Um, there's really strong criticism of people that hoard their money. There's really strong criticism of people that oppress the poor. But, um, but again, you get those, that, those, that same dichotomy in Protestantism, and you get the same dichotomy in Catholicism as well. And so it's just interesting to see how there is this thing called Christianity, but, or religion in general, but religion doesn't stand on itself. No, no one um, lives out their religious principles in a vacuum. They interpret or look at their religion or understand it from um, you know, their own particular worldview. And when you live in the United States and you've internalized capitalist um, ideas and capitalist ethics and capitalist values, that's the prism through which you're going to read the scriptures and you're going to interpret things in a really shitty, incorrect way if you've internalized those capitalist values and you'll make something out of Christianity which, uh, again, is revolutionary and progressive. Um, and you're going to take that and turn it into something that's reactionary and pro-capitalist, et cetera, et cetera. And where, yeah, it just becomes this thing where, yeah, God is here to like help me get rich type of thing. So when did Mormonism shift from being like this, like socialist, like you know, progressive religion to being what it is now? Like who, who capitalized it essentially? Uh, it, the the changes happened roughly towards the end of the 1800s. Um, Mormonism was progressive economically. There were a lot of racist ideas, so those of course weren't progressive back in those days. So the church has flipped now where their when economic did ideas start? Uh, like 1830. 1830. So that kind of first period was very progressive economically, but very re um, reactionary in terms of racism, and things like that. Now, of course, it's flipped. The racism isn't such a problem anymore. It's still a problem, but not nearly like it was. A lot of progress has been made, but economically it's just turned 180 degrees and gone back. But the time they shifted from um, and basically abandoned all of those socialist ideas was roughly around in the late 1800s and the turn of the century and there's probably two reasons. One reason was that a lot of people know that Mormons practiced polygamy uh, in Utah in the early years and there was a lot of persecution from the federal government so polygamy was illegal so the federal government was sending like the military and police etc to come and arrest ch uh, church leaders for practicing polygamy so a lot of them had to go underground and we're basically just trying to hide from like federal authorities. But at the same time that a law was passed making polygamy illegal, um, it, there was another, other laws um, or other stipulations embedded in that same law that made polygamy illegal that also prevented the church itself from owning more than even a pretty small amount of property. And so again, the, the church just basically owned everything collectively and so that law, which also which um, was meant to basically prevent the practice of polygamy, but also it was meant to break up like the church's um, economic holdings, and so they was kind of were forced to basically shift to a more capitalist model um, by those problems from the federal government. And then secondly, um, Mormons like just wanted to to start fitting in and assimilating and being accepted as Americans. And so they kind of incorporated all these American values um, and jettisoned a lot of their old socialist values. And again, that's what you see today when you hear uh, general authorities talk, I mean, especially to like the media and things like that. I mean, 
they just try as hard as they can to act like Mormons are no different than any other Christian and, and just to totally downplay anything that's kind of odd or weird about Latter-day Saints where they just want to have us looked at as, as just like good old uh, patriotic Americans, you know. Right, um, I, uh, wanted to ask you something about the uh, early uh, pioneers and uh, how some of them uh, came from England and other uh, northern European countries. So would you say that with, with um, uh, some notions of uh, socialist, socialism, uh, maybe from a revolutionary tradition back home, uh, so would you say that um, the English, well, the, the Mormon pioneers that came from England uh, probably come from a char uh, Chartist? Uh, uh, yeah, Chartist or Owenite background. Uh, I'm referring to the... Uh, utopian uh, socialists. Yes, uh, utopian socialists uh, uh, from the mid-1800s. Yeah, so those were just kind of common ideas floating around England at the time. And the people that converted, I mean, if you're in England and you're living a nice life and have plenty of money, et cetera, you know, very little chance you're going to convert to this strange American religion and leave everything and cross the ocean on a boat and then go across the plains to Utah. You know, these are pretty much, they're like poor people. And uh, so, again, socialist ideas would, would have just made a ton of sense to them given their, the background that they came from being poor. And then, um, again, because those texts are in the Bible as well. Even. And what other trends uh, within socialism uh, were, you, were you possibly thinking of when, when you mentioned that they came with socialist, socialistic ideas? Uh, I mean, not. I wouldn't know of like any specific, specific trends, but just that that was kind of the milieu in England at the time, and these were poor working class people that um, they came across. So it's not that they were like highly um, ideological, um, the people that came and that converted to Mormonism, but that um, you know they were very accepting of socialist ideas, you know, because they came from the working classes in England. And again, there's that explicit doctrines about those type of ideas in the scriptures. There's one example of a guy named um, um, Louis um, Bertrand, I believe is his name. And he was one of the first um, uh, Mormon converts in France in, I believe, like 1850. And he was a member, he was... Um, he, edited, he was the editor of the biggest um, socialist magazine or newspaper in France at the time called La Populaire. And his, uh, that movement was the, um, oh, I should have prepared some comments about him. Maybe Blankist? Uh, Mid-century, mid-1800s France. Um, I'm sorry, the name is, is, I'm losing the name, but so he edited this newspaper and he converted to, uh, to Mormonism and then he was in prison um, for a period of time because that was uh, during the revolution of 1849 and then later when Napoleon III, there was a counter-revolution, Napoleon III came back into power, he and many other socialists including like Victor Hugo for example had to flee the country. Um, but, um, so this guy, Louis Bertrand, he um, helped um, translate the Book of Mormon into French. He became um, a missionary and a state president. And then he ended up, ha again, having to flee France for a time and went to the Isle of Man, where a bunch of other prominent socialists, including Victor Hugo, had, la had, had to flee to. And supposedly this guy preached um, Mormonism to Victor Hugo because they were friends from the socialist days when they were both in France together. And then that guy, um, Bertrand again, he later immigrated to Utah. Um, he was a faithful member his whole life. And 
again, a pretty prominent socialist in France. There's also a guy named Bertino, a Platino Rota Canati, who was a famous, uh, a really prominent anarchist who came, was born in Greece and then um, ended up immigrating to Mexico later on. And he was like the one of the very first converts in Mexico and he was a staunch anarchist. He didn't stay in the church until he died. He ended up leaving the church later on. But um, that was another example of a guy that, you know, came from a strong socialist background and, you know, saw the val saw in the teachings of the church and in the Book of Mormon um, the fact that those socialist teachings were, you know, there. You know. How, how do you feel about the mainstream LDS's church revolutionary potential in the future? I mean, especially given the fact that the additional scriptures, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, have such strong characteristics of social theory, the idea of a corrupt society where there's big differences between rich and poor, pretty much almost always get destroyed, and that's a huge component of it. How do you feel that the potential for the future of the LDS Church is not necessarily the place that holds now? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, it is tough for too many Mormons to get involved in like leftist movements because there is the main thing that the church preaches now. It seems like, like their main priority is just to teach being obedient to the leadership and like paying your tithing, um, maybe not drinking alcohol. <laughs> but there's such an emphasis on being obedient to the leadership, and the leadership is so right wing and reactionary that it would be hard to imagine that even though all those like resources exist within the scriptures, that people would be able to really look at those and probably take them seriously and act on it because they're, the bigger priority is just to kind of do whatever the current leadership of the church is, is telling people to do or what they're preaching or what they're emphasizing. And again, they're definitely not emphasizing that. So it's tough, but at the same time, there are more and more Mormons um, you know, who do think outside the box and are a little bit more unorthodox. It's not as, um, Mormons aren't as like isolated from the rest of the world and society as they used to be. Um, so, you know, maybe in the future that, that that might change. But also, I guess, you know, the church is growing a lot in Latin America. It's growing a lot in Africa. So, you know, in Utah, someone hears the word socialism and they freak out think you're the devil or something, but if there's a Mormon in Argentina or Mormons in El Salvador um, that, you know, read what's in the scriptures and, you know, there are plenty of uh, socialists in El Salvador, so that's going to make perfect sense to them, you know, that being Mormon and being socialist is really, if you are a Mormon, you should be a socialist instead of being um, a socialist in spite of being a Mormon. And I had a chance to go to El Salvador a couple of years ago and, and talk with some members down there. And, um, you know, the one member I talked to, I because I was kind of asking him at the time, I, I haven't followed Salvadoran politics too much the last few years, but at the time there was a socialist president. You know, he was from the, the party of the former guerrillas that fought the Civil War uh, against the, the, the military government. Um, I believe it's FMLN. Sorry, it's been so long, but um, his name is Maurice Pons. Okay, cool. So he was the president at the time, maybe still is. <laughs> and um, so I was asking this one member, I'm like, well, hey, how do you, from a ward in San Salvador, I'm like, hey, how do most of the members vote? And he's like, well, the poor members basically vote for the FMLN, which is a lot of them, and the wealthier members vote for the you know, for the right wing party. It's kind of like a 50-50 split. It's just based on if you were poor or if you were rich. There was even a, a bishop of that same uh, congregation um, was not like active in the FMLN, but his father had been, um, his father was a teacher. And in the late 70s, right as the Civil War was just getting started, the Salvadoran military was sending death squads around killing a lot of priests, killing a lot of labor organizers, killing a lot of teachers. All those groups of people were considered just kind of um, sympathetic to the guerrillas. And so a lot of 
people who were just assassinated. So the, the bishop at that time of the, Sal the San Salvador Ward that I went to, his dad was a teacher who had been assassinated by the government. And so, you know, his sympathies were much more to the left as a result. So in different countries, I guess the prospects are much better if, you know, at a, a time comes when more and more members live outside the U.S in places that are more friendly to socialism and obviously Latin America being the best example. You know, maybe that will change and maybe once these old white guys that are in the leadership of the church now slowly die off and you get more people from Latin America filling the ranks of the, uh, you know, climbing the hierarchy higher and higher, then there might be more and more um, sympathy for leftist or socialist ideas within the church, but that will take, I guess, a long time. Oh, you just want to shut it down. I don't want to keep it too long. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's give yeah. him a hand. All right. If you have more questions, sorry. Right. No, I think. Did anybody else have any questions? I felt like you had one, Stuart. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe it, keep it, it was short. brewing. It was brewing, but it was for sure. Uh, let's see. Well, okay. How are you doing? Yeah. No, I think. Uh, oh yeah, I was thinking. I was going to ask you. <laughs> Maybe um, if you had some, if you had done some research on uh, Joe Hill's uh, <laughs> background, if if his um, if he was raised Mormon or how? Well, Joe Joe Hill wasn't from Utah, but he um, he moved here to work, and then you know that's when there was a murder and he was accused of the murder. And then eventually um, executed, of course. So he didn't. Um, yeah, he didn't actually grow up here. Um, so he wasn't LDS. But there was a lot of talk about that because they, there was this idea that the leadership of the LDS Church tried to have him executed. But that's not. You know, as time has gone on, people have kind of discredited that idea. There was hostility towards. The IWW and folks like Joe Hill just generally, but it was just the civil authorities and apparently it was that, like a non-LDS judge that oversaw the trial and everything. So the idea that there was kind of like a Mormon conspiracy to kill Joe Hill isn't, it just isn't the case. But It's also worth pointing out, just as a, a minor fact, that uh, in the 20s and 30s, uh, the Socialist Party, Qua Socialist Party, was fairly active here in Utah. I think Murray was kind of a hotbed. Yeah, and um, in places where socialism was decreasing um, due to some Mormon ideals and stuff like that, um, the members of the church who were part of the Socialist Party had ability to sort of create a buffer zone where they weren't as affected by other federal politics and things like that. I mean, it's it died out like a lot of the other stuff did, but it stayed strong for a while as well. So there is that book, you, the guy you mentioned, again, I feel bad I don't remember his name, but... Yeah, McCormick. McCormick wrote the entire book, so maybe you guys have already read it. Maybe it's Thank you. All right, let's give him a hand. Thank you all for uh, presenting for uh, Revolutionary Student Union. Uh, Again, thank you and uh, good night.